All right, friends here in the sanctuary, I'd invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles. We are about ready to start our final lesson in the book of Exodus, so go ahead and grab your seats. Yeah. All right. Our last day um, studying Exodus. This is our last... Yeah, the summer has flown by. The summer has gone by so quickly. It's true. It's right, well, true. since the summer is flying by, we are in our final series on Exodus here. So thank you so much to everybody who is tuning in from home. I know we have folks on the live stream, and I hope that our sundial is working and you can hear us. Just a reminder, as always, if you are watching the live stream, we do invite your comments, and you can share those in the Facebook comment section. That's what we will be checking. Yep. And if any folks here in the sanctuary would like to participate, we invite you to raise your hand, and we will do our best to remember to repeat your comment back into the microphone. Yes. I know last week we did not quite uh, do that successfully every time, yep. but we will, we will uh, try to be better about that. So, uh, so where we're headed after this, <laughs> as this is the last weekend of the summer, yeah. next yeah. Sunday we have two new adult Sunday school classes starting. Mm -hmm. uh, they will both be in hybrid format. We have one that is going to be this uh, live streamed from the sanctuary class, <laughs> and then also the home builders class will be meeting uh, in person and on Zoom. Yep. So two different options starting next week for the fall. Our live streamed class here from the sanctuary is going to be really exciting. And it is going to be exploring creativity and the arts and the aesthetic dimension of life for the whole congregation. We know this past spring, Pastor Kyle led a really cool workshop with folks exploring their own acts of creativity and how that was a spiritual practice. And there was so much good energy and enthusiasm about that. We wanted to share some of that energy with the broader congregation. But we know that not everyone is especially interested in being artistic or creative necessarily themselves. But all of us enjoy the arts and enjoy beauty in one way or another. Whether we look at paintings or we read novels or we enjoy a deliciously cooked meal or garden and arrange flowers or listen to music or perhaps we create some of those things ourselves and maybe more of us do than we quite realize. But beauty and creativity is something that we all are involved in in one way or another. And so this class will be exploring how do we engage that side of life to the glory of God? And what does it reveal to us about who our creator God is? So it's gonna be a really cool format. Each week we will have part of the hour in uh, Bible study and theological reflection. And juxtaposed with that part of the hour, folks who are engaged in artistic or creative pursuits sharing their work and being interviewed a little bit about how they view their art or their craft in relation to their faith. So it'll be um, a really wonderful time of reflecting on who our creator God is and how that affects all of our engagement with the creative side of life. So that starts next Sunday at 940, mm -hmm. both here in the sanctuary and on live stream and on sundial. Yep. Then the home builders class is also regathering for the fall yeah. and they will be meeting in what room? I think that they will be meeting in the old parlor so it would be our new coffee house. Okay yes. okay on the first floor of the old parlor yep. and that is also going to be hybrid on zoom so you can participate on zoom if you'd rather do that. Yes. All right, so those are our two new Sunday school options starting next Sunday. And, and they will be actually studying a, a video series called Chasing Vines. It's by Beth Moore, very popular um, Christian educator, um, teacher, um, speaker. And I, th I believe that series looks specifically at John 15 and um, you yes. know, really focuses on John 15. So if you're interested in that, you can do that. That's in person and on Zoom in the new coffee house. Great, so we hope that one of those two adult Sunday school options will be right for you and those both start next week. We also, speaking of John, are wrapping up our Wednesday night Zoom Bible study of the Gospel of John this Wednesday and we'll be starting a brand new series the following week. 
We also know our mom's Bible study is getting ready to mm -hmm. gear up for the fall. Uh, the Pathfinders group with Wendy will be starting a new fall series. And we're going to be bringing back a fall series of Bible study in the park this yes. September. Yes. So lots of new uh, ways to get involved in Christian education this fall. Yes. But today, we are wrapping up <laughs> Exodus, and we have a lot to get through. Uh, we won't be able to read every single part of our last few chapters, but we will uh, read some excerpts and sort of talk about the big picture here. But before we do that, let's pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for this time that we have had together as this really wonderful community that has developed using this miracle of technology you've given us and the way that all of us in person and on live stream and on sundial have had the opportunity to explore your word together. We thank you for the book of Exodus, for the amazing story that it tells, for the truths that it reveals about who you are and how you care for your people. We ask especially, God, that you would guide our reading and our conversation this morning. May this final time of study be fruitful and insightful and lead us to new understanding of you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You want to close the door? Thanks. All right. So uh, to, today we are going to be focusing on the last five chapters of Exodus, uh, 25 or 35 through 40. Okay. But before we do that, I want to give us just a zoom out for a minute and give us a little bit of an overview of this kind of where we are in the second half of this story. Yeah. Because things have been pretty intense the last few weeks. Yes, I would and agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, been pretty intense. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. just to put what we're going to read today in yes. a little bit of context. Okay. Good. Of course, the first half of the book tells the amazing story of God liberating the people from Egypt and slavery, yep. bringing them across the Red Sea. When they're on the other side, then in chapter 20, we have the giving of the law. God gives the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. Then these several series, uh, these several chapters of elaboration of further laws that help sort of apply those Ten Commandments to various circumstances. And that's in chapters 21 through 24. Then, starting with chapter 25, we have six chapters of really detailed instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. And these are detailed. They really emphasize the way that there's so much beauty and skill and ornate uh, fancy materials and images that are to be crafted into all of these ritual items. Uh, images sometimes that even remind us of God's presence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and so chapters 25 through 31 are these really detailed instructions, almost blueprints at times, for how, how the Ark of the Covenant and the Temple are supposed to be made with such detail and such care and such beauty. So while Moses is on the mountain getting those instructions from God, <laughs> chapter 32 tells us about what's going on with the people back at the foot of the mountain. And it's not good. And it's not good. We have the uh, incident with the golden calf when, ironically, just as Moses is receiving instructions for how people are to experience God's presence— the people get disgruntled. They are upset that Moses isn't with them. Therefore, they feel like God isn't with them. Mm -hmm. So they gather all of their jewelry and their gold, and they make a big idol of a golden calf, and they start worshiping it. God is, of course, angry about that because they have just violated the first two commandments. <laughs> They haven't even had a chance to really start living into this new covenant life, and they've already blown it. Yeah. They have already made this idol, already started worshiping this idol. Um, God is understandably angry. And so while Moses is on the mountain with God, God expresses that anger and that sorrow to Moses. And uh, God says, you know, I am going to just destroy these people, take out my wrath on them. 
And Moses pleads with God not to do that. Moses intercedes on behalf of his people and reminds God to be faithful to God's own promises and God's own character. And God agrees not to destroy Israel. And that takes place in chapter 32. But then um, Moses uh, goes back to God to try to make atonement. And God says, you know, okay, I'm not going to destroy these people, but really get out of here. Go on, go to your promised land. I'm not coming with you. (laughs) (laughs) And Moses once again intercedes on behalf of his people to God. The first intercession was for God not to destroy them. But now Moses is reminding God of God's promises to be faithful and to be present. And Moses says um, in chapter 33, verse 15, um, well, in verse 14, he quotes back to God God's own words. He said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to God, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. So Moses reminds God that God has promised to be with his people. And Moses says, if you're not going to be with us, we don't even want to go to this promised land. Um, And God God says, you know, yes, I, I will not abandon you. God says in verse 17, I will do the very thing that you have asked for you have found favor in my sight. And then we have this really interesting vignette at the end of chapter 33, where Moses kind of takes it to the next level then and says, God, show me your glory, the sort of full weight of the splendor of God's presence. And God says, if you were to see that, you would die. (laughs) But he kind of works out this little deal. He says, you hide in this cleft in the rock, Turn your back, and I'll pass by, and you can just see sort of the glimpse of my backside. You could not handle seeing my full glory, you know, fate head on. But you hide behind this rock. I'll let you catch just a glimpse of my glory. Um, Then in chapter 34, we have the renewal of the covenant. We have this really beautiful um, word from God in verse 6 where God says about God's self, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, I know that's a a section that is often quoted in our own um, assurance of pardon in our worship services, Mm -hmm. when God reiterates that God is steadfast and loving and forgiving, but... Then in verse 7, God says that, you know, I do have to keep people accountable for evil. Mm -hmm. So God is forgiving, but God is not a pushover. Mm -hmm. And then Moses makes new stone tablets with the law engraved on them again. We have this uh, renewal of the covenant in the second half of chapter 34 where God once again, it's not quite a reiteration of the Ten Commandments, but it is once again God giving commands to God's people for how to live in this relationship in the right way. They're going to try again. (laughs) So that is where we are picking up with chapter 35. Moses and God's people have been on quite this rocky journey with God of, of trying to be faithful and falling short and being angry at one another, and trying to come to some reconciliation, and God forgiving, and the covenant being renewed. So where do they go from here? How do you suppose at this particular moment in the story, the people of Israel are feeling? I know that's a huge question. We can't really quite (laughs) generalize, but wow, they've been on a journey in these last several chapters. I think they're traumatized, actually. Yeah. I think they're dealing with a high level of trauma at this point. Hmm. I mean, just knowing where they came from, being in Egypt, being persecuted, um, 
and then going through the wilderness, um, which had to be, you know, very hard and very challenging, yeah. and always thinking, is God with us or not? <laughs> you know, and yeah. having to think about that all the time and kind of going back and forth. You know, oh, God's with us because of the manna. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, I don't think God's with us anymore. And then it's like the rock at Haran. And then they think, oh, God's with us. But then, so it's like just this back and forth. And then even with God, there's a back and forth. Like, oh, I want these people. These are my people. And then in that one verse, he says, no, Moses, they're your people. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's like, so I think, I think at this point, the Israelites really have to be working through some high-level trauma. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And that, that yeah. central sort of anxiety of, yeah. is God with us or not? Yeah. That has really been weighing heavily on them yeah. throughout this whole book. Yeah. But especially in this act of idolatry with the golden calf. Yeah. That really yeah. seemed to be the central fear that really prompted mm. them to go down that path of idolatry. Exactly. That just, that fear about fear. God is not really with us. Yeah. yeah. So, they're going to try to make this covenant work again. <laughs> they have renewed their promises to one another, God and God's people. So what we get here, it's really interesting, is a description of building a physical space where people can be assured God's presence is dwelling. And we once again have five whole chapters of really elaborate, detailed descriptions of when they build the tabernacle now and how they make it and what it looks like and how it all fits together. And it might seem kind of strange just reading this with no context. Like, why do they really have to tell us about the number of wooden rings and how they're connected and what is the point? But keeping in mind this deeply troubling question that has clearly been plaguing the people for so long of can we really be confident of God's presence? This tabernacle, this um, Ark of the Covenant, these altars, this place that God is giving the people to be able to encounter God's presence is hugely significant. So it makes sense why there is so much detail devoted to it. So we're not going to read um, every single section here, but we are going to read a little bit to kind of give you a sense of what's going on. So we're going to start with chapter 35, and we're going to read 35 verse 1 through 36 verse 7, the introduction of this section. So... Um, Kyle, would you start us off with verses 1 to 19? Allison, would you read 20 through 35? Is this mic working okay? And then I'll finish it up. It is working? 20 to what? Uh, 20 to 35. Okay. So 1 through 19? Mm-hmm. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, These are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest for the, to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, This is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing to bring the, to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, bronze, Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, and another type of durable leather, a K of wood, olive oil for the light, uh, for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle with its tent and its covering, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases. The ark with its poles and, atone, and, and the 
atonement cover and the curtain that shields it. The table with its poles and all its articles and the bread of the presence. The lampstand that is for light with its accessories, lamps and oil for the light. The altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the curtain for the doorway at the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the bronze basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard and their ropes, the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments of, for Aaron and the priest and the garments for his son when they serve as priests. Then all the congregation of the Israelites withdrew from the presence of Moses, and they came everyone whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and brought the Lord's offering to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the sacred vestments. So they came both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and pendants, all sorts of gold objects, everyone bringing an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or crimson yarn or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or fine leather brought them. Everyone who could make an offering of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's offering. And everyone who possessed acacia wood or any use in the work brought it. Um, all the skillful women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and crimson yarns and fine linen. All the women whose hearts moved them to use their skills spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women whose hearts made them willing to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has, caused, has called by name Be Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, he has filled him with divine spirit, with skill, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood in every kind of craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every kind of work done by an artisan or by a designer, by an embroiderer, in blue, purple, and crimson yards and yarns and in fine linen, or by a weaver, by any sort of artisan or skilled designer. Ooh. Bezalel and Ohaliab and every skillful one to whom the Lord had given skill and understanding to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. Moses called Bezalel and Ohaliab and every skillful one to whom the Lord had given skill, everyone whose heart was stirred to come do the work, and they received from Moses all the free will offerings that the Israelites had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning, so that all the artisans who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task being performed, and said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else of an offering for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for what they had already brought was more than enough to do all the work. All right. So we have had a couple of comments saying that Kyle is really hard to hear. So if we can turn his mic up, that would be good. That's just through the... Just through the streaming, right? Yeah. 
All right, so let's talk through this kind of section by section, because there's a lot here, and it's easy to get sort of bogged down in the names and the details. But this is some really fascinating stuff here. So before we get to the details about building the sanctuary, God starts at the beginning of chapter 35 by reiterating this command about keeping the Sabbath. Out of all the commandments that God has given, you know, the ten major commandments and then all the following instructions, why is the Sabbath, do you think, emphasized here one more time? That's a really good question. Um, so my guess is because, I, co- I, guess, I guess I have a couple of guesses. One is maybe because they're going into a period now of work, hmm. of building, yeah. and God wants to remind them that what they're building it for. Yeah. Right, because you can get up on, you can get hung up on work for work's sake, mm-hmm. right? But then you lose what you're actually working for. So all this work they're going to be doing, all the gifts and skills they're going to be using as artisans, as designers, they're using it for the Lord. Yeah. So that's that's what that's I guess my main guess. That is so interesting that this reminder to keep the Sabbath of holy rest comes right before this extended discussion of how they're doing the opposite of resting. Yeah. Yeah. So those ideas that those two things inform each other, this pattern of rest and then work and then rest, Mm -hmm. and that somehow it's for the purpose of pointing us to God. Right. And notice at the end of all of this, they had to say, stop bringing. You know, it's like, it's almost like, okay, you're working too hard. Just let's tone it down. Let's stop. Let's literally stop bringing in all this stuff because it's all beautiful. I'm sure it was all beautiful and wonderful, but it was enough. It's not like, let's keep accumulating, right? That's like so our culture, right? Let's just, keep, if, if you're making it, I'm accepting it, <laughs> you know? And I'll, I'll keep accumulating. But here it's kind of like, we've done our work, now we stop. Oh, what a great connection. Yeah. Kyle, what do you think? Um, I, I think it also goes back to just becoming a distinctive people. Mm, so, yeah. Uh, you know, we, I was thinking about Allison's comment about trauma. Um, I, you know, they, these people had been enslaved for, I think, hundreds of years at this point. And so that was itself a major trauma. And then to be out in the wilderness and have to have the whole idea of who a God is completely redefined for them. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the fact that Moses went away because he was the tangible mediator was the reason that they started turning to something crafted with hands. And then to have, you know, God, God actually has some of them killed. And, and it's as if with, with this threat of, of being killed, if you, kill, if, you, if you break the Sabbath, it's as if God is saying there's this red line and, and I need you to know that everything's going to be redefined now. Yeah. And... And it seems to me that the cult, which is the, the worship practices that are being brought together at this point, seem to me to provide a practical way to come together as a community and not be in a constant sense of, oh my gosh, is he with me or is he not with yeah. me? And so these rituals that they're creating and this place that they're helping put together becomes a... A therapy for them, yeah. in effect, a yeah. theological therapy. Yeah. So the physical objects that they are going to be creating help remind them to have confidence in God's faithfulness. It's not. A, but, yeah. It's not at all the same as worshiping the calf. Right. Um, it is. It is a communal expression, a ritual that has markings and a calendar and a rhythm. And a a clear teaching in it. Yeah. And so, for me, the theological therapy that's happening is totally dependent upon the Sabbath being kept. Yeah. And so not only is he, like, sort of defining the culture, and we, we can say, again, that, you know, 
what we can see from the promise of Abraham is that God's doing something particular for the world here too, not just for these people Mm -hmm. that are traumatized. Yeah. So God's doing something for the world, but that's later. For now, it's like you got to know who you are so that you can speak for me. Yeah. And if you can't trust that I'm going to show up, (laughs) maybe this ritual is for God too. (laughs) You know, because God is, you know, the fire does flame out from when when the fat is thrown on the on the uh, on the place where they sacri- what's it called the pyre or whatever they uh, the um, altar the fire they threw the they f- threw the fat on there and it flames out so it's like you know a visual sort of um, metaphor for the the wrath of God burning out yeah. and yet there's this at, at one meant this peace that comes, this mm-hmm. atonement that comes. Yeah. So they're learning to live into this covenant, not only through the rituals they're going to do using these sacred objects, but also through the rhythm of time. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that this is so different than the way they were worshiping the golden calf. And, and, and anything, any reference they had back to Egypt, Egyptian gods. Oh, yeah. Right. Different from the worship of Egyptian gods. Right. One thing that occurs to me is that maybe this is also helping them recognize how this intense period of work they're going to be doing is different from the work they were doing in Egypt. Hmm. That as they were enslaved and building with bricks for Pharaoh, they were just kept being forced to do more and more and more, and it was never enough. Whereas here, as you pointed out, Allison, there, there are limits. There's humaneness. There's the ability to sort of do this work as a free and joyful offering rather than as an act of dehumanizing coercion. And, and, and that's, that's a distinction that I think that, that probably needs to be made with all of us and I would say a lot of our young people growing up who have seen you know patriarchy and have seen some things racism and and they've seen some things even in the church or other institutions where they decide you know it's time to leave these things completely Um, you know I I think that there is a sense in which the dis- going from having a slave situation where you're working all the time to going to a place where you have to stop working. The idea is that freedom has no boundaries. Like, like oh, well, if freedom is freedom, then I can do whatever I want whenever I want. But in fact, freedom has structure to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So freedom has some rhythm to it, some structure. Yeah. And, and living into the law is not a, a millstone around our neck. It's an invitation into a freedom that we could not achieve otherwise. That's a great point. So. Yeah. So in this freedom that comes from being God's covenant people... They get their instructions, starting in verse 4. God reiterates these instructions in sort of condensed version here. Well, Moses reiterates um, these instructions that God had given to Moses back in chapters 25 through 31. Moses uh, reiterates to the people, okay, here's the way that God has commanded we're going to set up this sacred space. And it was designed to be, you know, an elaborate, imposing structure, but also to be portable. And so that's interesting to keep in mind as we're trying to imagine this in our minds, that this was something that there are people on the way headed to the promised land. They'd be able to pack this up and set it up at each of their sort of stopping points along their journey. So we get these instructions here in verses 4 through 19. And then this time... The people seem to be on board, and they excitedly get to work. And they start bringing all of their treasures, 
uh, starting in verse 20, we have this great description, and it repeats over and over again how everyone is playing a role. They're bringing their gold, they're bringing their jewelry, they're bringing their fabrics and their woods. Uh, people that have skills in arts and crafts are using those skills to help make things. This is a communal project. And then we also meet these couple of individuals here uh, in verse 30, Bezalel and Ohaliab, who are people that God has especially gifted to be really skilled craftspeople. And they're given the job of kind of leading and teaching and also taking a more sort of specific uh, role. So I think it's really cool how we see that this whole construction project of building the space for worship really is clearly a collaborative effort of the whole community. But there are also special people who are uniquely gifted by the Holy Spirit in particular ways, who have special leadership roles. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, your initial question about, you know, how, how are the Israelites feeling at this point? And I said probably they are experiencing a high level of trauma. I think that should probably go hand in hand with the fact that this, this is an extremely resilient people mm, as well. Yeah. And I mean, I think we see that through this chapter, you know, I mean, just them being able to mobilize like this to, to you know, um, to use their gifts in this way and to come together as a community and really create something so beautiful. And I, I just think that speaks to their resilience. So yeah. I just don't want to seem like when I said that they were experiencing a high level of uh, trauma, I don't want it to seem like I'm like bashing them or by oh, any right, means. Right. Because, because I think this is an extremely resilient people that rises from the ashes mm -hmm. of their slavery. Yeah, right? absolutely. They, and, and they create a new life for themselves through mm -hmm. what God is doing and the promises of God. Yeah. Are, you know, God's giving them new life, and that's really amazing. So. Yeah, and they are being led by God to do something really extraordinary here. And we get more of a sense of just how extraordinary it is in the next several chapters. Betty on Facebook asks a really interesting question. She says, where did these treasures come from? Uh -huh. They had been yeah. slaves. Yeah. Is this what their Egyptian neighbors gave them? Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, it seems like some of it are things like animal hides and wood right. and things that they perhaps could have harvested from the natural environment. Yeah. Some of them are things like jewelry that they probably would have brought with them. Yeah. They, they left Egypt full. Yeah. They did. They did. Yeah, they, they knew that they were going to be leaving. They packed their bags. Um, how they acquire, how they had any of those material luxury goods in Egypt is a good question, but, but they clearly had some things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so maybe if, you know, if everybody only had maybe one or two prized garments or linens or whatever, they bring them all yeah, together. They, they all yeah. bring their best. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a study of, of not just Israel, but of humans, how we can sort of find this powerful world changing moment and we walk out on dry land with our arms full of the treasure of our oppressors mm -hmm. and within just a few months or weeks uh, we're freaking out again Yeah, you know <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of who we are as humans and that's again why I think this is so important for this to be an expression of the community God's participating with the people in building this tabernacle. Yeah. And, and this is something where God, that is, that is uh, God's the audience, but the people are going to find this rhythm that's going to be something that carries them through hundreds and even thousands of years in terms of finding um, a home and then being carried off and still having these rituals even in their homes. I mean, these are... These are things that yeah. will always be with them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I'm especially struck by reading this section is, you know, a few chapters back in chapter 32, we had the story of the people building the golden calf. And in that story, we also saw 
all the people coming together, all the people bringing their gold and their earrings and their treasure, putting it all together. But in that case, it was for a really destructive and evil purpose. Here, we, it almost seems like this telling is designed to kind of be the inverse of that. That mm. now we see the people coming together, bringing their treasures to build something, but they're going to do it in a way that honors God this time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a different experience. I mean, you know, you said it was an evil thing they did. It was, but for them, it was just a reaction to fear. And it yeah. was Aaron's... Aaron's desire to maybe placate these fears. Yeah. And, Whereas um, here it's motivated not by fear, but they're in 21 their hearts were stirred. Right. It's motivated by a love of God. So they did bring some gold up for the calf, but ultimately, you know, Aaron's the center stage in terms of crafting it. But this seems broad. Yeah. The group is broad that's coming. Yeah. Um, to where they, like Allison was saying, they, they have to say, well, you know, we've got enough stuff here. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, there, there's such a, a freeness and an abundance and a, I feel a joyfulness in this right. section here that was not the case when they were bringing their materials to build the idol. Right, right. So what a redemption story, even, yes. even before we get to learning anything too particular about the tabernacle. Just the, the way that the community is stirred by God to willingly come. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we got an email, Allison and I did from a member who, who has a family member that's at risk from COVID. Um, and she just was, she wrote us this beautiful long email telling us that she would be back in church at some point. But for now, she, she, needs, she will actively worship from home. Mm -hmm. and, and in that email, you could just hear this longing to be back together. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, this mm -hmm. longing to be in the room together. Mm -hmm. um, and how different is that than what our sort of default mode is right now in our culture of just not just because of pandemic, sometimes we need to be just alone in the house for sure, but even before the pandemic ever hit, this idea that we're somehow connected everywhere, but we're not connected anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, I, and I think this is a beautiful, beautiful illustration of how a community can come together and raise a raise a prayer and raise a place and yeah. m and tell the story and enact the story and yeah. I mean, it's very powerful it's yeah. very very powerful absolutely so then in the next several chapters we get some more detail about how exactly they do that mm -hmm. how they tell the story through the particular things they construct in chapter 36, we learn about the construction of the tabernacle, of the outer tent, made of linen and of animal skins and embroidered with images of angels. In chapter 37, we learn about them making the Ark of the Covenant, the box. Um, that again, we have these images of cherubim, uh, there's a table for the bread of the presence, that manna that was a reminder of the way that God provided for them in the wilderness. The lampstand made of pure gold, where the lamp that signifies God's presence is. They make an altar for incense. The creativity strikes me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The craftsmanship. Absolutely. The, yeah. Absolutely. You know what? what man might have designed for evil, God's meant for good. You know, the idea that maybe some of these skills were picked up along the way in Egypt. And, yeah. and now they're being redeemed and yeah. used for the glory of God. Yeah. They make in chapter 38, they make another altar for burnt offerings. Um, they make some linen hangings to designate the outer court. Then in chapter 39, they make vestments, special garments for the priests that, again, are embroidered and beautiful and ornate. Um, and then they finally, they make, yeah, tunics for Aaron and his sons, for those who are going to be the priests. And that's so interesting that it's Aaron, right? <laughs> Aaron, who is the one who led the people into making the false idol, 
Now Aaron and his sons get special garments uh, to do a special priestly job to lead the people in right worship of the true God. Reminds you of Peter yeah. after the denial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Reminds you of the Marshall Plan yeah. <laughs> after World War II. Yeah. It's like, you know, let's bring them back up here and put them in the place they were supposed to be in. Yeah. Mm. So then in chapter 40, they finally complete it and they set it up and they put it all together. And we get detailed instructions here in chapter 40 about how all of these different elements are to be set up. Um, so Moses did as the Lord commanded it. They set it up, they laid it out, they spread the tent. Um, this space is here, it's all ready. And then let's see what happens. Why don't we start, um, Let's, we, gosh, we could read this whole chapter, but we don't have time. <laughs> Let's start with uh, chapter 40, verse 29. Kyle, would you read 29 to 33? And then Allison, would you read 34 to 38? Sure. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle and the tent of the meeting and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin, basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting as appro uh, or approached the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each, sta each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. Hmm. Hmm. So Moses finished the work. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. But Moses is not able to enter. Why do you suppose that is? I mean, maybe there's something really clear that God's trying to do, that this mediator's temporary. He's going to die. He's not God himself. Mm. As much as I've used the power of my presence in him and through him, yeah. uh, there'll be a time when he goes to dust too. Yeah. So the people have so closely associated God's presence with Moses up until now. Right. And when Moses leaves, they're afraid God has they left. They think God has left. So maybe yeah. God is showing that Moses is not God. Yeah. That God is right. with them even when Moses won't be. Yeah. Right. <sighs> Interesting that the cloud has played quite a part in all of Exodus, right? The, yeah. the, the pillar of cloud and the... You fire. know, the fire. Yes. I mean, that has, you know, led them through the wilderness. And now here at the very end of the chapter, the cloud is still among the people. Yeah, yeah. And the cloud, um, it, it rests, it's located now in the tabernacle. And that's what guides them as they continue on their journey. They are going to be, they're not staying at the foot of the mountain forever. There are people who they have a promise that God has given them land and they're journeying towards it. But this cloud now is going to continue to direct their journey. And it will be, it'll, you know, a light on the tabernacle. And then when it departs, they know it's time to pack everything up, to move the tabernacle, to continue to follow that cloud as they have been all along yeah. to the next stage of their journey. Okay. That God will, as God promised, 
will continue to be with them as they sojourn forward. And they don't really know that it's going to be 40 more years in the desert. They but, have no idea. But, <laughs> yeah. but that tabernacle will go with them wherever they go. Yeah. So. It's beautiful. I'm going to run. So we have just a moment or two left. But I want to circle back to something, Allison, at the very first week of this Exodus study. Mm -hmm. You introduced us to four themes that we were going to find in this book. Mm -hmm. um, liberation, mm -hmm. covenant, the law, and God's presence. So I think as we close this study, it might be helpful to reflect on what have we seen revealed about those four themes as we've read this book? Um, folks at home, we would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I think this is also a question for us to reflect on in the coming week. But how have we seen and what have we learned about God's liberation of God's people, about the covenant that God makes, about the law that God gives, and about God's presence with God's people? And maybe I, one thing I think that has become clear is that those are not like four separate things <laughs> exactly. that you can just think about one of them in isolation, <laughs> right. but that they are all so connected. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. They are all connected, that's for sure. Yeah, the God who has from the very first chapter been doing the work of setting people free to be the people God has made them to be, sort of does that through making covenants. Those covenants require a law to be able to live in that covenant rightly. And that through that act of covenant, we experience God's presence. Right. And that's the presence of the God who liberated the people in the first place, that yeah. these are yes. all so bound up with one another. They are. Yeah, yeah they are. And I'd be interested to hear just the, the things that have been meaningful to you through this study. Yeah. You know, the things that have really stood out to you. If you want to put that on Facebook or if you just want to think about that. What has been the theme that has been the most, you know, uh, comforting to you throughout this? Um, the theme that has been the most challenging for you yeah. throughout this study? Because there were... We, we, we went through some tough scripture yeah. in Exodus. We yeah. really did. Absolutely. So, um, so it would be just interesting to hear some feedback from you. Yeah. And that this, of course, is not the end of the story. No, no. But the story the of God's continued <laughs> presence with God's people then continues through the rest of the Old yeah. Testament. Yeah. So, yeah. Any final thoughts you want to share, Allison, as we wrap up this study? I, I think personally, I can just share something personal, is that this, this, this book really challenged me to think about leadership hmm. um, in, in some new ways. I mean, <clears throat> just, you know, the golden calf incident in Exodus 32 and how easily people can be led astray. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just watched a, a documentary, I think it was 2020 or something on Friday night, about Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Oh, wow. And it was really, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is so reminding me of Exodus 32, how he was building this amusement park called like Heritage Land or something like that. But then he wanted to build a, a hotel with that. And he was asking everybody to give $1,000. And if they gave $1,000 for this hotel, they would be able to stay like three or four nights there every year until they die, <laughs> right? So, but Jim Baker can never... He never fulfilled that promise because, of course, he, you know, everything went, they went bankrupt. So, but it's, it's very interesting how people can be led to do things that maybe that aren't good for them, that don't um, build up their relationship with Christ and instead lead them astray. And, and so I think leadership is a really huge lesson in the book of Exodus that mm. we need to take heed to. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. And I think that all of us, as we reflect on what we've read in this book, will we'll have similar things that really strike yeah. us. So feel free yeah. to share those in the comment section. Yeah. We'd love to continue these conversations in any yeah. other ways that we can. <laughs> but why don't I close us in prayer? Right. All right. Oh God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for who you are. 
We thank you that you are a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping a steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God, we thank you for the ways that you are liberating your people from all the things that keep them in bondage, from all the pharaohs in our world today. We know, O oh God, that you are breaking those chains and leading us to liberation. We thank you, God, for the covenant that you have made and continue to keep with us. We thank you for your law and ask you for the grace to more fully keep it day by day. And we praise you for your beautiful and glorious presence and ask that we might be further able to know and see and feel it. Thank you, God, for this study, for all the people who have tuned in in various ways, for all the comments that have been lifted up, for all the questions that have been asked, and for all the ways that this epic story will continue to work in our hearts and our minds. We ask that we will continue to know you and love you, the one true God, now and forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you Good all so in. much. <laughs> and just a reminder that starting next week, we have two new classes at 940 AM. You can uh, join us in the sanctuary or on live stream for our series on creativity and the arts. Or you can tune into the Home Builders class using the Beth Moore study in person or on Zoom. Thank you so much.